talked about how to name, uh, for example, disulfur trioxide, carbon dioxide, all of those things, right? So type three compounds, which are nonmetals with nonmetals. So we'll go ahead and we'll pick up with acids. Now acids uh, are going to essentially be divisible into two types. There are acids that are kind of closer to type one compounds, and there's acids that are kind of closer to type three compounds. So the first type uh, we're gonna call oxyacids. And so those oxy acids essentially are going to, there we go, are the ones that contain the oxy anions in form, their formulas. So those are all the ions that end in eight, A-T-E, or ite, I-T-E. So for example, an acid of nitrate would be nitric acid. All you do is you take nitrate and put a hydrogen in front and that will cancel the charge. And then there's gonna be binary acids, which all are easy to identify because they don't contain oxygen. So that would be like HCl, HBr, HS, H2S. So in other words, it's hydrogen paired with everything that ends in IDE, okay? Like for example, chloride, bromide, fluoride, sulfide, and cyanide also, which has two elements in it. All right, so um, as far as this goes, the oxy acid, as I said, just has a polyatomic ion and then as many hydrogens as are needed to cancel out the negative charge. So sulfate is SO4 two minus. So you have two hydrogens in front in the acid. Phosphate is three minus. So you'd need three oxygens in the front to cancel that out. And that's because remember the hydrogens are each, what charge? Plus, Plus one. Good. When you put them in water, do the hydrogens dissociate and come off? Do you remember? It depends. Some acids, yes, other ones, no. What do we call the acids where the hydrogens all come off in water? No, those are still aqueous, strong. They're called strong, okay? So for example, um, nitric acid, HNO3 is strong. So when you put it in water, the H comes back off. Phosphoric acid is the opposite. So we'd call it weak, which means very few of the hydrogens come off, like less than one in 10, you know, it's closer to one in a hundred will actually come off. But we'll, re we'll uh, review that in chapter four. Just wanted to see if you still remember it. Now, the way that we work the names on these is if the ion that it's coming from, the parent ion ends in eight, you change the ending to ic acid. So for example, bromate, if you add an H in front will become bromic acid, okay? Nitrate becomes nitric acid, carbonate becomes carbonic acid, yeah. Uh, not usually pronounced carbonic, but carbonic acid. If the ion ends in ite, it's going to become an us acid, O-U-S, O-U-S, excuse me, not O-U-S. So this shows a couple examples. So nitrate is NO3 minus, right? If I put an H in front, nitrate becomes nitric acid. NO2 minus is nitrite, good. So nitrite, when you uh, put an H plus in front, gives you nitrous acid. That makes sense. HClO4, ClO4 minus is chlorate. So HClO4 would be perchloric acid, yeah, so ClO4 is perchlorate, so perchloric acid. Uh, this might be wrong in the notes. Uh, it should be hypochlorous acid. Does it say hyponitrous for some reason? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, that was just a copy paste error. So what do we call ClO minus? ClO minus? 
almost hypochlorite. hypochlorite. Good. So hypochlorite becomes hypochlorous acid. Now, for some reason with sulfate and phosphate, the reason probably is historical. Uh, they were named before we came up with rules. So instead of calling sulfate sulfic acid, that would be correct if we did it by these rules, but no one calls it sulfic acid. It's sulfuric acid or sulfurous acid. All right, so you say the whole name of the element, unfortunately. Phosphate, instead of being phosphate, Phosphoric, phosphic acid, it's phosphoric acid, not phosphorusic acid, it's phosphoric acid. But you've heard both of those words before, right? Sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid, hopefully. So that's just how we are going to do that. Okay. Now, the ions based on IDE endings, so chloride, bromide, sulfide, cyanide, any of those, they have no oxygens in them. And you just change the ending to ic acid, but you add hydro to the front of the name. Now, this is technically only true if they are dissolved in water, okay? So we would always write AQ after them. If it's not dissolved in water, hydrogen in front of chlorine would just be called hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen with fluorine would be called hydrogen fluoride. I hope that kind of makes sense. I'm not going to really penalize you if you get those slightly confused. Um, but that's why we're always going to write AQ on the acids, uh, the, these hydro acids. But I can leave out AQ on the other acids. How do you figure out how many hydrogens you need? Well, it all depends. If the ion is from group one, I'm group seven, you need one hydrogen. If it's from group six, you need two. Uh, essentially, it's like you're canceling out the charge, right? Because chloride would be minus one. The H is H plus one. So you'd need two hydrogens, those. These only apply, again, to things in group six and group seven doesn't work for group. It doesn't work for oxygen because if you add two hydrogens to oxygen, you get water, which we don't ever call um, hydroxide acid. That's just called water. doesn't work with nitrogen because if you add three hydrogens to nitrogen, they come at the end, NH3, and that's name is ammonia. Yeah. doesn't work for phosphorus because that gets its own name. Arsenic gets its own name, silicon gets its own name. The rest have all special names that we don't need to learn. Okay. But if you're curious, with phosphorus, it's called phosphine. With arsenic, it's called arsine. With silicon, it's called silane. What is C with four hydrogens called? That's an organic chemical. You should know that one. CH4 is called, it's right here. Methane. Methane. Good. Yeah. So that's a totally different set of rules. But you should know CH4 because how many of you have heard of methane before? Yeah, natural gas. So just like water and ammonia, methane is a good one to know, CH4. Okay. So instead of going on, uh, let's do some practice. So, avert your eyes for a second here. I just want to give you the same ones I gave to my class yesterday. So that way, if I write an exam and there's similarities, you can say, oh, it's not fair. They got they got these questions and we didn't. Although that technique is probably gonna happen. I'm gonna give different exams. Okay. Let's see if I can copy and paste. No copying and pasting. 
It's horrible. Okay. So these are the ones P205, CUCN. I'll put them up in a second. Uh, let's see here. KM04, HBRO3. If you're watching the video, don't cheat and look at the version that splashes up on the screen. So if you want to go ahead and write these down real quick. And I'm going to add a couple more. So write those first and then you can name them in a second because I'm going to turn off the screen in a couple seconds. weird that you can't copy and paste. Okay, so we can work on those and then I'll let me get a couple more.
Okay, let's take a look at this. So the first compound is which type? Type three. Type three. Yeah, type three. It's the only one of the compounds that's a non-metal, non-metal that I have here. So its name is going to be, we need prefixes. So two phosphoruses. So good, diphosphorus. And then we have five oxygens, so that would be pentoxide. pentoxide. Excellent. Or pentaoxide, but pentoxide is preferred. Okay. The next one uh, begins with copper, so it's going to be either a type one or a type two. Uh, copper makes more than one charge, right? So it's a type two. We need to put its charge in the name. So what's copper's charge? Plus one, and that's because... Uh, exactly, Cn is always minus one, and the total charge must add up to zero. zero. Good. So this is copper. Uh, copper one. And then cyanide, very good. Uh, the next one. Good. Potassium only makes one charge, so we don't put a charge. It's potassium and then MNO4 minus is permanganate. Good. HBRO3 is an acid, right? BRO3, what's the name of BRO3 minus? Bromate. Bromate, so its name will be bromic acid. This is not to be confused with hydrobromic acid, which would be what? Gas. Uh, what? Gas. Uh, that's hydrogen bromide. But hydrobromic acid would be HBr. HBr. In water, yeah. Uh, the next one, magnesium only makes one charge, so it's just magnesium. And uh, ClO4, well, we know ClO3 is chlorate. So ClO4 minus would be perchlorate. Very good. Second there, I almost wrote permanganate. All right, and then this next one's a little tougher. It's another acid. Be careful, C2O4 is not CRO4. It's C2O4, what's that called? Oxalate, C2O4 two minus is oxalate. So oxalate becomes oxalic acid, a fairly important compound. We will see it again in chapter four. For sure. Any questions? No? Okay. So we'll go ahead and we'll go on now to chapter three. And I'm going to go to uh, the very beginning of chapter three. We have not talked about the beginning of chapter three. So give me a second here. 
And so what I'm interested in, first of all, is going to be uh, the numbers in the periodic table over here in black. So, for example, aluminum, 26.98, phosphorus, 30.97, oxygen, 16.00. Uh, I want to know where those numbers are coming from. First of all, uh, what do we call those numbers? Yeah, atomic weights usually is the, the number we give, okay? Uh, so atomic masses, atomic weights are fine. Uh, as opposed to the numbers that are in red on that periodic table, which are atomic numbers, okay? So what we'd like to be able to know then is um, how those numbers are derived. Now, you remember for most elements, they are a mixture of two or more isotopes. And isotopes must have a different mass. Why do two isotopes of the same element have to have different masses? Yeah, different numbers of neutrons. So the ones with more neutrons will have a larger mass than the ones with fewer neutrons. So those numbers, except for a few like aluminum, aluminum only has one isotope. Um, so the mass of an aluminum atom would be 26.98 AMU atomic mass units. Um, except for a few of those, those are a weighted average of all the isotopes. Now, it can't be a regular average. A regular average means you add up all the masses and divide by however many you have, right? And that's because some of the isotopes are more frequent in nature than others. So for example, so the way we figure out the amount of these isotopes and what their masses are, is we use an instrument called a mass spectrometer. And so we use mass spectrometry. So in its simplest form, what a mass spectrometer does is it takes a sample. So in this case, we would take a sample of an element, a pure element. We would put it in water or a, an appropriate solvent. And we would then inject it into a, the mass spectrometer. Let's look at the inside of a mass spectrometer. This is the old style type. We're not gonna go into the details of mass spectrometer here. But what you do, yes? How big is that? It varies. Some of them can be the width of a room. Um, so, you know, from here to here. Uh, we're actually in the process of getting one. Um, and they're very expensive. This would be even on the lower end, we're looking at probably $100,000, okay? Uh, that would be probably from about half the size of this desk, okay? So fairly, fairly big. But yeah, these old style ones are, are very large. Um, so what you do with it is, and this is the simplified version of it, is you inject a very, very small sample of whatever element you're dealing with here. And when it's passed into the instrument, uh, what you see happens is, and I know on the videos, this is probably, you're not seeing my cursor, unfortunately, but after the sample is introduced, it is rapidly heated so that it forms a gas. Okay. So now, like if I'm dealing with carbon, I would have gaseous carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. They would all be turned into gases. And, the sample is then because there's a gas pushing this through. So usually like helium or argon or something like that. So the helium that's pushing this through will take it to this next part here, which is an electron beam. These electron beams are very, very high energy electrons. You know, I think like if you're watching any kind of science fiction, like phaser beams or something, you know, they're tremendous elect uh, energy. And what those electrons beams do is they rip off electrons. They shred electrons off of the element. And so not all of them, but maybe only one or two. You can also do this with compounds, but for right now, we're looking only at elements. And so if you rip an electron off of an, other, uh, an atom that was neutral before, what charge does it have now? It's now a positively charged ion, okay? So it doesn't matter how it normally bonds. The mass spectrometer chemistry is totally different because we don't usually shoot things with electron beams. So whatever it is, is now positively charged and it's being pushed ahead by the glass. I mean, by the gas that's pumping it here. 
And then all of a sudden it runs into contact with these plates, these metal plates that are charged negatively. So how's it going to feel about those negative charges? It's going to be attracted to them. And some of them will get smacked into the metal, into the metal plates, but the ones that are being blown fast enough by the gas will go right through those plates and they'll be accelerated. So, you know, it's like you're sitting in the car and then someone slams on the accelerator. So they're accelerated into a magnetic field. And what then happens is the heavier particles, just think of you know a very heavy object in a, uh, in a car, are going to pretty much resist having their, their uh, I guess you would say their momentum changed by much. So they're gonna be swung very little, just like something very heavy in the back of your car. As you take a hard turn, it might not move by much, right? But something very light, if you take a very hard turn, will be flung pretty far. And so ultimately what happens is the most massive particles don't change their, they change their direction the least, whereas the least massive ones change their direction the most. And then they smack in, they go around this curve and then smack into what's called the detector plate. And the detector plate measures where they get hit. Particles that get hit in this drawing on the furthest to the left are the lightest particles. And the particles that go the furthest to the right on this machine are the heaviest. And essentially what the detector is counting is how many hits. So if there's many, if there's a lot more of the lighter isotopes than the heavier ones, which is usually the case for most of these things, then you're going to get a lot more counts on the detector from the lighter position than you would that heavier position. And then what the machine will do is it will take all these counts and it will produce for you what's called a mass spectrum. This is what they would look like if you blew it up substantially, figure B here. Uh, and that's usually not what they look like. They usually look like just a bunch of lines, okay? But the way this drawing is represented is what you would do is you would take the areas under all of those curves. If you've had calculus, what do we call that? Anyone know? It would be the integral, yeah. So the machine has a way of doing integration. And so it integrates all the curves and it says, what's the area here? What's the area here? What's the area here? And it adds up all those areas. And then ultimately it says, what percent of all those areas added up is underneath this peak? And that's the one at mass 19.90, for example. Okay. And it then pumps these out, but they look like lines actually. And so 91% of them come out like this first peak, 0.3% come out at 21 and 9% come out over here. Uh, it actually doesn't really look like this. What it does is it'll put it at 100, and this would be at like 0.5, and this would be at like 10. So you'd have to divide each of these by 100. But for right now, to, to keep things easy, we're going to leave it like this. So this is telling me 91% of my isotope is whatever element is 20. What element is this probably, by the way? Can you figure it out from the periodic table? Not potassium. Uh, now, remember, an, a proton usually will have a mass of about one, uh, and a neutron will have a mass of about one. So which element would have a mass of about 20? Neon. Yeah, this is almost certainly neon. Because if we look at neon, it's saying on the periodic table 20.18. So the 20 is easy to account for. This mass of 20, this is really 19.9. And 22 would be, you know, like 21.98. So if you average just those two and you forget the one in the middle, you're going to get something like 20.18, okay? So this is a neon sample. And we're only seeing three isotopes, and they are neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. These numbers right here, the 91, the 0 0.3, and the 9, are called the relative abundances, written as percents. Okay, and then these are the masses rounded off. 
a modern spectrometer would be able to give me these masses to a lot of significant digits, okay? Now, instead of using grams per moles, we're gonna use the equivalent atomic mass units. So we would call this 20 atomic mass units, 21 atomic mass units. Okay. Now you should have done this calculation that we're about to do in Chem 120, but now you will understand where these numbers are coming from. Okay. So let's say we have magnesium. So let's say we took a pure magnesium sample and we introduced it into a mass spectrometer. And instead of looking at the, you know, the graph, we're just gonna get the data. This is the data that the mass spectrometer would give you. The masses of the three isotopes, magnesium 24, magnesium 25, and magnesium 26, and their frequencies. Okay, so do you see how that corresponds to the graph we just looked at? Good. All right, what we would like to find is the average atomic mass. And we already know the answer to this. What is the answer? Yeah, it's on the periodic table. For magnesium, it's 24.31. Uh, in reality, this data is going to give us more significant digits, though. It's going to give us 24.30 something. Okay. So let's see where the number comes from. So the first thing we need to do is we need to, we need to rewrite, rewrite, excuse me talking too long. So these are all percentages. So we could rewrite these all as weights. So as a weight, that means change it from a, a percent to a decimal. So as a decimal, this would be 0 0.78994. This would be, all I'm doing is shifting the decimal place, two places to the left. And so in a massive, what I would consider very stupid naming concept, concept, what do we call these? We call these fractions. I didn't mind the rule, okay. So instead of calling them fractions because they're obviously decimals, um, I'll call them weights instead, okay? Which I like. So all we have to do is take the weight of each isotope times its mass and add them together. If you had a lot, you would not do this by hand. What would you probably use? Um, any of you have ever heard of Excel the spreadsheet program? You'd, you'd make Excel do it. You'd still have to type in all these numbers though. All right, for three element, for three isotopes, it's easy to do this by hand. So let's just do that. The only thing that's annoying about it is the sig dig. So 0.78994. So the weight of magnesium 24 times its mass. Plus the weight of magnesium 25. 0.100001 times 24.986. plus the weight of the other one here. Times this 25.983. And I'm in a bit of a lazy mood here. Um, I know the answer will come out to 24 point uh, three zero, is it six? They're all cheap. I'll go look and see what it was on Monday, I mean yesterday. So yesterday the answer was 24.307. I'm sure it's still that number today. And U, which again is atomic mass units. That's the mass of the average mass of a single potassium or magnesium atom. 
Any questions? You all better be nice or I'll give you one of these with 10 isotopes to do, okay? So, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. That would be kind of pointless. All right, we introduced the mole yeah, uh, on Tuesday, right? Or we reacquainted ourselves with the mole on Tuesday and molar masses. So we're not going to go to percent composition. Again, something you did in Chem 120. Uh, we're going to do something new, though, today. It's actually not really new. It's a new way of looking at things. So percent composition is going to be very valuable to us, and we'll use it a few times today in useful applications. For a compound, the percent composition of a compound is just going to be a list of all of its um, elements in its formula. Uh, and then what we do is we say what percent of the mass comes from each of those elements. You could do it differently for other kinds of compounds, like, for example, hydrates, which we talked about in the lab today. Hydrates contain water, right? So you could say what's the percent of, instead of hydrogen or oxygen, you could say what's the percent of water in the hydrate. For a mixture, you could say, well, what's the percent of each component in the mixture? We're going to be interested in only doing this for right now for the uh, for, for compounds. Okay, so the way we do this is we first have to start off by calculating the molar mass of the compound. And then we look at the mass of each element in that compound. So, for example, if we had water, the molar mass of water is 18.02. There's two hydrogens in water. So we would look on the periodic table and say two times 1.008 would be 2.016, okay? And then for oxygen, there's only one oxygen. So it would be 16 divided by the molar mass, 18.02. And you multiply by 100 to make it into a percent. All right. So let's take a look at uh, this compound here, chlorobenzene. You might have heard of benzene before. This is benzene, except one of its hydrogens has been switched to a chlorine. Uh, this is almost a Lewis structure. What's the only thing missing? Can you tell? Which element other than hydrogen doesn't seem to have an octet here? Start on the right side, it'll be easier. Chlorine. chlorine. Yeah, chlorine doesn't have an octet as it's drawn. So that implies that there must be some lone pairs that were left off. How many lone pairs would there have to be? Three. Three. Good. Chlorine needs to follow the octet rule here. So it's only got two electrons being shown. So there must be a pair, a pair, and a pair. All right. So we want to find the percent composition of this. So the first thing we do is... Find the molar mass. Yeah, so we need the molar mass. And if you forgive me, I'm not going to write that out. I'm going to just say it. So six on six times carbon, right? Which is six times 4.01 plus five hydrogens, five times 1.008 plus chlorine is 35.45. You don't need, ever need to show your work doing that unless the quiz can specifically says show your work on doing that. So I'm getting 112.55. You want to be very careful not to make errors on these things because they will then mess up the whole rest of the problem. say fully about a 20% to 30% of errors are mistakes on molar masses. So if there's ever time at the end of an exam, always double check your molar masses. Okay, so I'm gonna have three answers to this question. A percent of carbon, a percent of hydrogen, and a percent of chlorine. Right? So the percent of carbon is 
six carbons. So it's six times 12.01. I'm not going to write the units for right now over 112.55. Technically, the units don't work because 12.01 grams per mole of carbon versus grams per mole of chlorobenzene, they don't technically cancel. So shh, don't tell anyone. Six times 12.01 divided by 112.55. Uh, I'm getting 64.02. Yeah, uh, four sig digs because the carbon is four. Good. So 64.02%. Most of the time, by the way, people will do all of them to the same percent. So even if the hydrogen comes out to the thousands place, usually people will give them all to the same decimal place. I'm not going to right now. I'm just going to follow the usual sig dig rules. Five times. 1.008 over 112.55 times 100%. So what is that? Five times 1.008 divided by... I'm getting 4.478%. Uh, yeah. And again, uh, most people would not write it that way. They would say 4.48% because if this one's going to the hundredth place, they're going to make them all go to the hundredth place. But that's not how we learned our safety rules. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's two ways to find chlorine at this point. Because it's the last one. And we know the percents have to add up to 100 one way you could do it would just be to say 100% minus 64.02 plus 4.478. Or you could use the formula, okay? If I use the formula, which is probably faster, 35.45 divided by 112, uh, I'm getting 31.50%. Um, I'm assuming there's, it'll definitely be the same thing. Are we all okay with this? Now, we don't find these just for the exercise of doing it. We do this because we now have a very powerful tool. If I'm working with chlorobenzene a lot, what I can now say is what? Every, a percent means for every 100 grams of the whole, there are, in the case of carbon, 64.02 grams of the part carbon. And in case of hydrogen, for every 100 grams of chlorobenzene, there is 4.478 grams of hydrogen. Okay, So I can use this over and over and over repetitively in problems. And it's also very easy to calculate. Uh, there's lots of apps that'll calculate these things super quick. I'll show you one in a minute. So that's how you need to think about this. Okay. So think of them as conversion factors between masses of the elements and the compound itself. So here is hexane. Hexane is C6H14. I know that it is 83.63% carbon and 16.38% hydrogen. So I now have three conversion factors I can say. Every 100 grams must have 83.63 grams of carbon. Notice I'm not using equal signs because hexane is not equal to carbon, is it? But I can use it in a conversion factor as saying they are equivalent. For every 100 grams, you have 86 grams of this. And you can change this to any mass or weight unit that you want. So you could use, instead of grams, you could use kilograms, you could use 
milligrams. And so long as you plan on staying on Earth, you could use pounds or tons, et cetera. Why do I say you have to stay on Earth to do this? Yeah, because gravity is relative, right? Although technically, they should even, you know, even if you do it on the moon, it should still be the thing. It's just pounds are kind of an arbitrary concept when you're talking about on the moon. Uh, what could you not do? Could you do milliliters? You couldn't do milliliters because that's volume. Yeah, it's not mass. So mass and weight. Weight is directly proportional to mass. So that's why you can use that. So for every 100 tons of hexane, there is 83.63 tons of carbon. OK, so you don't have to do unit conversions. Just make them all the same unit. OK, so how many grams of carbon are there in 185 grams of hexane? The fast way of doing it would be to do what? 185 times. How do you convert a percent into a fraction? Yeah, so you just change this to 0.8363 and multiply it. So that's the fast way, 185 times 0.8363. Doing it the way I've been explaining it, which takes a little longer to write, will give you exactly the same answer, which is for every 185 grams of hexane, Well, for every 100 grams of hexane, there's 83.63 grams of carbon. What is this number, 83.63 over 100? That's just 0.8363, what I was just saying a second ago, right? Yeah. And so regardless of how I type, write this, I'm just going to type in 185 times 0.8363, because that's faster. And this gives me 155 grams of carbon. Three significant digits. How many grams of hydrogen would there be? 30. Why? How could you do that so fast? Yes, because there's only two elements. And if you have 185 grams and 155 grams is carbon, the leftover must be hydrogen. Yeah. Always keep that kind of logic in your mind. You're going to use it a lot. Okay. Is there any questions on that? No. Okay. Let's go a little bit further here. Now, this one's a little trickier. I'm not giving you the mass of the compound. I'm giving you the mass of the element. So it's not going to be multiplied by the percent. It's going to be divided, as you'll see. OK. Uh, so what volume of hexane contains five grams of hydrogen? Uh, and I want the volume in milliliters. given that the density of hexane is this. Now, remember, I said you can't use these for milliliters, correct? Uh, these, But you can get them to grams, and then I gave you the density, so the density lets you go from grams to milliliters. Now, hopefully you're not just memorizing how to do these problems. The key is to think through them. So you're given two numbers here, which would be the better number to start with, the five grams or the 0.661 grams per ml. Yeah, you almost always only want to begin with things with one unit, not something divided by something else. The only time you'd ever begin with something with two units is if you're converting 
both the units. So if you're going from grams per milliliter into kilograms per liter or something like that, okay? So I'm gonna start with the five grams of hydrogen. No, oh, don't do that. Here we go. Why H and not H2? Yeah, it's not pure hydrogen, yeah. Only when you're talking about pure hydrogen by itself is it H2. Okay, this H is part of hexane. Okay, so to cancel the, hydro the grams of hydrogen, I'm going to use the 16.38 in the denominator, right? The units will always keep you honest. I will say that so many times. The hardest chapter that we're probably going to do for most people, chapter six, is only hard because people don't understand. It's all about making the units cancel. That's all you have to do. Okay, so this is for every 100 grams of hexane. And then I want to convert this to milliliters. So down in the denominator, I'm going to write 0.661 grams of hexane is. And you see, if you think about it the way I was talking about, you don't have to say to yourself, do I multiply, do I divide? Do I multiply, do I divide? Do I multiply? Because that's not how you want to do it. You want the units to cancel. That's all that happens grams over grams, grams of hexane over grams of hexane, and you get the answer you want. That's like 80% of what we do in this class. Okay, so five times 100 is 500, divided by 16.38. Divided by 0.661. And I'm coming up with 46.2. Anybody else get something like that? Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And you're all checking these things, right? Because remember, I won't be standing over you putting things in the calculator for you. So I'm, this is like doing your, your exercises with the calculator. Your thing, your fingers. Spread, uh, spread. Uh, by the way, if this were an exam, uh, to make things easy for me, what would you do to that answer? You should either underline it or put a square around it. Yeah. Okay. Especially if there's a whole bunch of things, you know, and if your work gets a little messy, you know, label things and say, this is the answer or whatever. So I, I don't have to go looking everywhere. Uh, before I get into combustion analysis, I would like to call out uh, a very important word, and that is, or, or pair of words, the percent composition and the density are what we call intensive properties. Does anyone remember what an intensive property is? It's a property which... Well, no. Does it change with the mass? Yeah, it doesn't change with the amount, yeah. It doesn't change with the amount, either grams, mass, milliliters, volume, or whatever. So it's a property which does not depend on the amount. Molar masses, like the numbers on the periodic table, are also intensive properties. Can you tell, molarity, when we get to molarity, is an intensive property. Now, listen to these intensive properties. Listen to their units. Density is grams per milliliter. Percent composition is grams of the element per 100 grams of the, the compound. Uh, molar masses are grams of the element per mole of the element. And molarity is moles of the element per liter. Masses are grams, volumes are milliliters or liters. What's the big difference, if you can tell? What did all of the intensive properties have in their units? If I said them aloud, I said what word on all of them? 
grams per milliliter, grams per mole, uh, moles per liter, per, per. So they're all ratios. That's the important thing. They're all something per something, right? They're one amount for every something else of another amount. So a density is a ratio between mass and volume. And atomic mass is atomic weight are ratios between mass and moles. Molarity is the ratio between moles and volume. So that's why they're all intensive because the amounts are already specified in the units. So grams per milliliter. And so all of those can be easily used as conversion factors. You can always use them to convert. So that's an intensive property. Okay. There's other ones that aren't, like I could say the color of a compound, for example, right? Uh, sulfur is yellow. If I have one gram of sulfur, it's yellow. If I have a thousand grams of sulfur, it is yellow. But we don't usually use that kind of a context. We usually use it mathematically. So that's really important because if I ask you for the density of five milliliters of hexane, what's the answer? What's the density of five milliliters of hexane? Good. And what's the density of 15 tons of hexane? 0.661, right? Because asking you the density, it doesn't matter whatsoever how much of it you have. The density just has to do with hexane. And technically, what else does it have to do with, as we saw in lab? <clears throat> the amount and the, I mean, it also has to do with the temperature, right? Because as the temperature changes, the density also changes. Okay. Since I didn't say anything about temperatures, ignore it. Okay. We're assuming room temperature. All right. A very, very useful technique is going to be combustion analysis. This is used for determining percent composition. It's unlikely to be something you will ever actually do. Um, I've never done it myself. But in order to figure out the percent composition of certain organic compounds, those are compounds that contain carbon always and almost always hydrogen, and sometimes oxygen, sometimes nitrogen, sometimes sulfur, but always carbon and hydrogen for sure. What we can do is we can burn them in a special kind of a furnace and look at what they give off. Whenever you burn an organic compound, so something with carbon and hydrogen, and burn means, or combustion means, you're taking that and reacting it with what? Combustion or burning means you're reacting with oxygen gas, right? You, how do we know that you need oxygen for something to burn? Look at your candle. Not your candle in front of you, but how do you put out a candle? You smother it, right? You can use and use your fingers. You, as soon as you deprive it of oxygen, the burning stops, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample of some chemical we want to analyze that has carbon, hydrogen, and maybe or maybe not oxygen. And we'll burn it and we'll collect the gases it gives off, which are always carbon dioxide and water. Okay. So long as there's plenty of oxygen, you'll get carbon dioxide and water. If you did this wrong and didn't give enough oxygen, instead of carbon dioxide, you'd get the much more dangerous carbon monoxide. Okay. So we're going to assume with plenty of oxygen. That's what we'll get. Matthew, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so combustion analysis, that's kind of how they do calories, right? Um, that's going to be calorimetry. You just burn it in a container full of water, and uh, you measure how much the temperature of the water goes up. So we'll look at that in Chapter 6. Yeah. You're not going to, like a donut, you won't analyze the amount of each element. Although if you want to find out if there's arsenic in your donuts, I guess combustion analysis could do it. So let's take a look at the apparatus. Because it's important to understand the apparatus for this to work. So the idea here is you take whatever sample you want. It's put in a special furnace. And then all these pieces here, although we're doing them in glass, these are probably special metal containers. Um, 
these are pieces that can be attached on and off, okay? We are always using excess oxygen gas. So we pump oxygen in to the first chamber, which has the sample and is being heated so much that the sample burns. The oxygen will then force the gases that are produced, these are probably filters, by the way, um, into a chamber that contains an absorber. You don't need to memorize what the absorbers are. But in this picture, the water absorber is magnesium perchlorate. Okay. And so the water gets trapped here. So then what's going through here? So all the water is stuck here. So then what goes out here? Uh, oxygen and CO2 are going here, right? Remember the oxygen is always being pushed through. The CO2 gets absorbed in this case on sodium hydroxide. And then since we're keep, we have an endless supply of O2 gas, oxygen would go out the end. This only works, as I said, if this contains carbon, hydrogen, and maybe oxygen. So yes or no oxygen doesn't matter, but it, it, those are the only three elements. Uh, for this to work, you had to have weighed the absorber before you did the burning. And you weighed this before you did the burning. And so then what would you do? You would say, well, this was 100 grams before I burned this. Now it's 111 grams after. So what does that mean? The extra mass must have come from the from the H2O, good. And then the same thing here, the extra mass must have come from the CO2. Using a similar technique, we can add absorbers for sulfur, okay? Because if you burn sulfur, it gives SO2. You could do this for, uh, let's see, nitrogen would be a little trickier, but you know, N2 gas, if you measure, if you were very careful about the O2, you could probably do that. Um, but there's just ways of tweaking it. So to keep our lives easier, all you're going to see on a combustion analysis problem is this is how much sample you started with, the elements in the compound, and uh, whether or not uh, how much H2O was produced and how much CO2 is produced. To do these problems, it is always helpful to begin by writing the percent composition of, or the percent of carbon in CO2 and the percent of hydrogen in water. That's where I would always start. And once you know that, you can use this over and over and over. So let me, uh, let me write that up here. So it's helpful to know that. So the percent carbon in CO2, If I calculate that real quick, that's going to be 12.01 over the molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.01 times 100%. And you know what? I'm going to be lazy. And I'm going to show you how to be lazy too. In only a few short steps. Once you have done a lot of homework and you're finding, if you're not getting molar masses wrong, and only if you're being good about this and you're not getting molar masses wrong, it's very helpful to go to this website. So you'll want to Google, not Google Maps, this website, uh, Lentech. And either molecular weight or molar mass. Or you could Google molar mass calculator. Lentech, I'm not even sure what they really do, um, but they uh, they put a lot of calculators up that are useful. I just find the Lentech one to be very useful, very easy to work with. And what it does is you just have to type in any chemical you want, so CO2. Oh, I didn't even have to do that. I could have just picked it and hit enter or calculate. And it does all the work for you. So it's telling me the molar mass and it's telling me the percent composition. Okay. 
So that's 27.29. If someone writes that down, that would be helpful. And then water would be H2O. So it's 11.19%. Why am I only looking at the carbon and the hydrogen? Because yeah, those are the elements I'm gonna to try to figure out, okay? I can't do oxygen because the problem is there's oxygen in water and in carbon dioxide. And on top of all that, what's the other problem? In the combustion analysis? Yeah, I'm adding oxygen in, in excess constantly. And what's also happening to the oxygen, it's also, leaving. So the only way I figure out the oxygen is I figure out the amount of carbon, the amount of hydrogen, and then the oxygen is whatever is left over. Okay. If I wanted to do nitrogen, I could do the same general technique. I could control the amount of oxygen very carefully, but use excess uh, nitrogen instead. All right. So now this is really nice because like, uh, what did we do? Chlorobenzene, C6, uh, H5Cl, boom, you got it. You can do hydrates. Like, for example, one of the hydrates uh, that I was talking about today, CuSO4 dot 5H2O. That's a pain to do by hand, but this does it for you like that. But note, they cannot be held responsible for errors in the calculation, so you can't sue them. All right, and you can't use this on an exam. I'm sorry. Um, so can you tell me please, uh, what was the answer for percent of carbon? 27.29%, what's 27.28, but anyway. And the percent of hydrogen, yeah, is two times 1.008 over, over 18.02 times 100%. What was it? 11.19? All right. Uh, I might give you that on an exam. I might not. What I'd probably do is ask you to do that as part A or something like that to see that you know how to do percent composition. Okay. So I've got 10 grams of a compound that has only carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and it's subjected to combustion analysis. At the end of the process, it was determined that 24.259 grams of carbon dioxide and 9.993 grams of water were produced. Determine the percent composition of the original compound. Now, initially, alarm bell should go off in your head. I'm getting 24.259 grams of this, and I started with 10 grams. How is that possible? Yeah, the oxygen. Ah, the carbon picked up oxygen and the hydrogen picked up oxygen. So the difference must be the oxygen. That makes sense to everybody? Okay. There's probably not going to be enough space on this question, so I'm going to keep it kind of small. All right, so the key is we just need to figure out from the carbon dioxide how much carbon there was. From the water, we need to figure out how much hydrogen there was. And we just conclude that the rest must be oxygen. Uh, I've seen a lot of people mess up this question because they only do carbon and hydrogen. Or what they do is they do only carbon and then they say the rest is hydrogen. And that wouldn't work because they totally forgot about the oxygen. So that's why I'm highlighting this. So don't forget to go back and make sure you've got the right elements. All right, so we need the percent of, we need the mass of carbon first. So that's easy. That's just going to be uh, 24.259 grams of CO2. For every 100 grams of CO2, there are. 27.29 grams of carbon. By the way, you didn't have to do it that way. You could just use moles, right? We've already talked about how about you can figure out how many grams of something there is if you know how many grams of starting material. Yeah. 
And then for the mass of the hydrogen, that's gonna be the water. So I've got 9.993 grams of water. So for every 100 grams of water, there are 11.19 grams of hydrogen, H, not, H, uh, not H2. Okay, so for the first one, cheat and just look at my work from yesterday. So the first one, uh, I got 6.620, and the next one, 1.118, right? And you notice that does not add up to 10 because of the oxygen. Now, if I want to find the percent composition, I'm not going to bother doing the mass of oxygen because if I'm doing percents, I can always find the percent of carbon, the percent of hydrogen, and then just say the rest is oxygen. Now, I picked a very easy number. I picked 10 grams. Converting that to a percent should be a piece of cake. So the percent of carbon is going to be 6.620 over 100, I mean, over 10 times 100. What is that? 66.20%, yeah. Uh, and remember, it's a 10 in the denominator because of the 10 grams. The carbon is the part, the 6.620, the 10 is the, the whole. Uh, what's going to be, be the percent of hydrogen? Without even calculating it, I should be able to say it's 11.18, right? And then I say the rest is oxygen, but you need to show me that. So how would I show that? That's 100% or calculate it. Oops. Minus the sum of everything left over 66 or that we've already done 66.20% plus 11.18%. Twenty one point sixty two. Twenty sixty two. Okay. This is very useful uh, for figuring out the purity of a compound because if you think you have a compound with a certain formula, when you burn it, you should get the right percents. It should match exactly, right? If what you're getting doesn't match, then it's probably not the Correct compound. Yeah, Matthew, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. All right, so we're kind of at the end. So what we're going to pick up uh, next time is empirical and molecular formula, and then we're going to combine these. So how you do combustion analysis to find the empirical formula. You've already done empirical and molecular formulas before, right? But now we're going to extend it and be more experimental about it, how, how we do it by experiment.